Welcome once again to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you an article from La Traviata, La Traviata, the December 1993 issue. And uh, I'm going to read this to you so that you'll know that I'm not the only one out here who's stark raving mad, as some of you tend to think. I want you to hear that not only, not only have I reached the conclusions that I have reached through years and years of diligent and very, very deep research, but many others have reached the same, and I mean the very same, conclusions. This is entitled, Secrets in the Vatican II, The Church and the Secret Societies, A Brief History. Pay close attention, and as always, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you have a tablet and a pen or pencil by your side at all times when you listen to the hour of the time. At a recent Church of England synod, a report on Freemasonry was presented to the assembled clerics and lay people for debate. Several speakers denounced Masonry as contrary to the teachings of Christianity and condemned Christians, especially clerics, who might be members. One speaker even went so far as to attack Masonry as blasphemous because he claimed its central initiation ritual, which involves a symbolic death and rebirth enactment, was a travesty of the Christian belief in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Since its inception, Freemasonry has been the target of Christian wrath. In the inner circle of Masonry, among those who have obtained higher degrees of initiation, there are Masons who understand that they are the inheritors of an ancient and pre-Christian tradition handed down from pagan times. The medieval Masons inherited this secret tradition in the form of symbolic teachings which expressed spiritual truths. These teachings originated in the pagan mysteries which were followed wildly, widely and wildly in the ancient world. These medieval masons inherited esoteric knowledge from their pagan forebears and this knowledge was incorporated into the sacred architecture of the cathedrals. Now I want you to pay real close attention because during my series on the mysteries when I found out what was concealed within most of the altars that were built during those times and I related it to you over the air, many people called me a liar. And you're going to hear verification of this, what was found, not only within the altars but throughout these cathedrals. So pay close attention, folks. This is very important. When the lodges of speculative, as opposed to operative Freemasonry, were founded in the 17th and 18th centuries, this knowledge was transformed into the symbolism which today forms the basis of Masonic ritual. With the persecution of alternative spiritual beliefs in medieval Christian Europe, the guardians of this ancient wisdom went underground, forming secret societies to preserve their pagan ideals, and these societies became the mysteries. The two major secret societies which were formed in this period, although they only revealed themselves in a public form in the 16th and 17th centuries, were Freemasonry and the Order of the Rosy Cross. While the Order of the Rosy Cross, or the Rosicrucians, is still a secret society which has received little publicity in modern times, considerable public attention has been drawn to Freemasonry recently. <laughs> oh my. The Masons regarded geometry as the most important of the arts and sciences according to their beliefs. Geometry had been taught by a pre-flood patriarch called Lamech, who had three sons. One invented geometry, another was the first Mason, and the third was a blacksmith who was the first human to work with precious metals. In common with Noah, Lamech was warned of an impending flood caused by the wickedness of humanity and the interference of the fallen angels in world affairs. Lamech and his sons decided to preserve their knowledge in two stone pillars so that future generations would discover it. 
The Masons believe that one of these pillars was discovered by the Greek god Hermes, also known to the Greeks as Hermes Trismegistus, or Thrice Greatest, and to the ancient Egyptians as the ibis-headed scribe of the gods Thoth, pronounced Tehuti, the so-called emerald tablet of Hermes is said to contain the essence of the lost wisdom from before the days of the biblical flood. According to occult sources, this tablet was discovered in a cave by the mystic Apollonius of Tyana, who was regarded by the early church as a rival to Jesus. The first published version of the emerald tablet dates from an Arabic source of the 8th century A.D., and it was not translated into Latin in Europe until the 13th century. However, the myth of the hermetic wisdom had a profound effect on the Gnostics, who were her her heretical Christians in direct conflict with the early church for attempting to fuse paganism with the new Christian faith. They also claimed to possess the secret teachings of Jesus divulged to only his inner circle of disciples. Masons claim these teachings were censored from the authorized version of the New Testament, which was approved by the church councils who met to decide the structure and dogma of early Christianity. In medieval Europe, Gnostic philosophy emerged in the rise of the heretical Christian sect, the Cathars, and the rise of the chivalric order of the Knights Templar. The Hermetic traditions provided the spiritual inspiration for many secret societies in the Middle Ages, and its influence can be discerned in both speculative Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. In the Masonic tradition, it is said that Masons were first organized into a corporate body during the building of the Tower of Babel. The concept of this tower was to reach up to heaven and contact God, according to Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. The fall of the Tower of Babel destroyed the common language spoken by humanity and ended the second golden age which followed the flood. The architecture of the tower was King Nimrod of Babylon, who was a mason. According to popular belief, the Hebrews received their knowledge of masonry from the Babylonians and introduced it to Egypt when they were taken into slavery. In Egypt, this knowledge was influenced by the mysteries and the occult traditions of the pyramid builders who were versed in the techniques of sacred geometry. The key to the pagan origins of Freemasonry lies in the semi-mythical story of the construction of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This building was regarded as the repository of ancient occult wisdom and symbolism by both the Freemasons and the Knights Templar. To build the temple, Solomon imported masons, artists, and craftsmen from neighboring countries. Specifically, he sent a message to the king of Tyre, asking if he could hire the services of the king's master builder, Hiram Abiff, who was killed in geometry. Who was skilled? <laughs> who was skilled in geometry? Uh, <laughs> Solomon appointed Hiram as the chief architect and master mason of the temple. Hiram completed the temple in seven years. The number is especially significant in occult tradition and Freemasonry, folks. But this achievement was overshadowed by his violent, mysterious death. Hiram was approached by three fellow masons who demanded the secret of the master mason's word. He refused and was beaten to death. They buried him in a shallow grave, they marked the grave with an acacia tree. His corpse was discovered fifteen days later. Solomon ordered that his body be exhumed and reburied with a full religious ceremony and honors due a craftsman of his rank. Early Masons historians regarded Hiram Abiff as a symbolic representative of Osiris, the Egyptian god of death and rebirth. In the third degree of Freemasonry, the candidate representing Hiram Abiff is raised from the dead by a special Masonic handshake known as the grip of the lion's paw or the lion's grip. In both Masonic and Egyptian mysteries, the resurrected God is buried on a hill in a tomb marked by a tree. In Royal Ark Masonry, the candidate for initiation is informed that the sacred name of God is really Jabulan 
This name has been deciphered as a coded reference to the two major gods of the Middle Eastern fertility cultus, Osiris and Baal, combined with the Hebrew tribal god, Jehovah. In masonry, God is also signified as the great architect of the universe, signifying the importance of sacred geometry, and also indicating that he creates nothing but designs and builds from that which has already been created. The political aspirations of Freemasonry re revealed in their influence on the revolutionary movements and proto-socialism of 18th and 19th century Europe can be traced back to the myth of the Golden Age during the reign of Osiris and Isis and before the flood to the Babylonian and Hebrew myths of creation. Occult tradition alleges that Hiram Abiff was secretly a member of an ancient society known as the Dionysian Artificers who first appeared about 1000 BC when the temple at Jerusalem was being erected. They took their name from the Greek god and possessed secret signs and passwords by which they recognized each other, were divided into chapters or lodges ruled by a master, and were dedicated to helping the poor. They established lodges in all the Mediterranean lands, and their influence spread as far east as India. With the rise of the Roman Empire, lodges were founded in Central and Western Europe and in the British Isles. The artificers were connected with another secret society known as the Ionians, members of this society had settled in Asia Minor and were dedicated to the spreading of civilization, especially in its Greek form, to what they regarded as the barbarian world. Allegedly, the Ionians were responsible for the famous temple of the goddess Diana at Ephesus. Architects from this society, together with members of the Dionysian artificers, traveled from Tyre to work on Solomon's temple. Later, the artificers called themselves the Sons of Solomon and used his magical seal, two interlaced triangles representing the union of the male and female energies as their trademark. The artificers who settled in Israel founded the Kassidans, who were a guild of craftsmen skilled in the repair of religious buildings. Now this new sect was instrumental in the foundation of the mystical Jewish group called the Essenes. The Essenes became famous through the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In occult tradition, Jesus of Nazareth was an Essene, and there are connections between this group and the medieval Knights Templar. The Dionysian artificers believed that the temples they built had to be reconstructed according to the principles of sacred geometry which reflected the divine plan of God. They constructed religious buildings to represent the human body as a symbol of the universe. They also promoted the political idea of utopia on earth which was expressed in symbolic form. The hammer and the chisel of the mason became the cosmic forces which shaped the spiritual destiny of mankind. The Roman architect and master builder Vitruvius, born in the first century AD, was influenced by the Dionysian artificers. His theories formed the basis for the architecture of the Roman Empire, and with the rediscovery of classical knowledge in the 16th century, also had an impact on the greatest architects of the Renaissance. Vitruvius's concept of the magical theater representing the micro microcosmos of the world as a symbol of the macrocosmos of the universe was repeated in William Shakespeare's famous phrase, quote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, unquote. And in the naming of his famous theater, The Globe, it is claimed that Shakespeare was a Rosicrucian initiate who was probably familiar with these ideas. Others take it farther and believe that the Shakespearean plays were really written by Sir Francis Bacon. In Masonic tradition, Caesar Augustus is the patron of the Masons in ancient Rome and is said to have been Grand Master of the Roman College of Architects. This society was organized into guilds with symbols based on the tools of their trade, such as the plumb line, the square, compasses, and the level.
The college had initiation rituals involving the pagan myth of death and rebirth, which are familiar from the Egyptian mysteries. A temple built and used by the college was unearthed at Pompeii, a city destroyed by the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 71 AD. Among the symbols discovered in the temple were the double triangle of Solomon, the black and white tracing board first used by the Dionysian artificers, the skull, the plumb line, the pilgrim's staff, and the ragged robe. The black and white tracing board was later seen on the battle flag of the Knights Templars, and then again on the floor of the cathedral as Chartres. built by the Knights Templar. These symbols later emerged in medieval masonry and also speculative Freemasonry. The traditions of the Roman College seem to have been passed on to the order of Comacene masters who flourished during the reign of the emperors Constantine and Theodosius in the 4th century AD, when Christianity was emerging as the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. According to legend, the order was founded by ex-members of the Roman College who were forced to flee from the barbarians. They set up their headquarters on the island of Comacini in Lake Como, and in 643 were placed under the patronage of the King of Lombardy who gave the order control over all the Masons and architects in Italy. The Comacene order was divided into lodges ruled by Grand Masters, wore white aprons and gloves, and recognized each other by secret signs and passwords. The order was responsible for the Lombardy and Romanesque styles of architecture and can be seen as the link between the architects and masons who built the pagan temples and the master builders who erected the Gothic cathedrals of Western Europe in the Christian Middle Ages. There is evidence that the Comacini masons traveled all over Europe and according to the historian Beattie, even reached Anglo-Saxon England where they built a church in Northumbria Although the Masons who built the medieval churches and cathedrals were nominally Christian, the proliferation of pagan symbols and images in these ancient buildings indicates many of them were still pagans at heart. And folks, this is what I explained to you about the pyramidal structure of organization in the secret society. Those at the bottom may go to a Christian church and really believe that they are Christian or attend other religions. But as they progress through the degrees of initiation, they are indoctrinated into the old pagan religions and the old gods come back to them with a vengeance until they reach the top. They are no longer Christian. They no longer worship Allah or Buddha or any of the gods or religious beliefs that they had before. They're all gone by that time and that's the purpose. You see, if those at the bottom were exposed all at once to what they would eventually learn through going up the degrees of initiation, none of them would stay long enough to get to the top. It is a process of slow, slow, but sure brainwashing. And it works. It works very, very, very good. Pagan symbols found include the Shilina Gig. These are crude representations of the naked female form in the shape of a woman with spread eagle legs displaying their genitals. They have been identified as images of the pagan goddess of fertility worshipped in Celtic times. Other carvings found in medieval churches depict monks and priests in sexual poses with wanton young girls performing homosexual acts are wearing the heads of animals. Even stranger examples of pagan masonry can be found. Professor Gregory Webb of Cambridge University, England, in 1946, Secretary of the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments and an authority on medieval architecture, at the end of the war was appointed by the British government to survey ancient churches in southern England which had been damaged by the German bombing.
In one of the churches, he discovered that a Nazi bomb had dislodged the top of the altar, revealing the interior for the first time since the 14th century. Inside the damaged altar, Webb and his team discovered a stone image of a phallus, phallus, the phallus, in fact, of Osiris, which had been carefully concealed within the hollowed interior. At first, Webb, at first, they thought that this discovery was unique until he began to examine other churches. He found that virtually all Virtually all, ladies and gentlemen, of the pre-Reformation churches built before the outbreak of the bubonic plague at the end of the 14th century, when church buildings ceased for a long period, had altars which hid fertility symbols, phalluses, which dedicated the Christian churches to the old pagan religion, the phallus of the religion of Osiris, which came from the ancient religion of Babylon, where the phallus represented the generative force, Baal, who was also known as Nimrod. See, you always learn something listening to the hour of the time. The public image of protective associations using their powers to promote fair trade and business ethics concealed the fact that the medieval society of Freemasons was a secret society with pagan origins, clandestinely promoting radical political opinions, socialism, the occult initiates, who were the real power behind the secret societies, knew that to achieve their aim they had to use the political system, and in the twelfth century they began to put their plan into operation. It is known as the Great Plan or the Great Work. It is what is bringing the New World Order to fruition into the world. The relationship between the Pope and the Grand Masters of the secret societies, ladies and gentlemen, was an explosive one. The Church regarded the members of the secret societies as spiritual anarchists who were agents of satanic conspiracy against organized religion. The Church saw them as competitors for their flock, the sheep. The Freemasons and Rosicrucians styled themselves as wolves and believed that the sheep belonged to them and were their legal and lawful prey. The Freemasons and Rosicrucians, on the other hand, also accused the Church of suppressing the true teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, and many secret societies were fervently anti-clerical. They plotted the overthrow of the Catholic Church because it opposed the old pagan religions and the Manichean heresy from which these groups drew their spiritual inspiration. Ah, if they only knew that the Catholic Church had already done it long ago, and that's why they feared the secret societies as competitors. At first, secret societies were supported by the Church. When the Vatican perceived the secret societies to be a political and ideological threat to the church, the climate of suspicion, suspicious tolerance began to change, culminating with King Philip of France wiping out the order of the Knights Templar in the 14th century. In the lodges of Freemasonry, in the actual orders of Templars, they attribute the date of the execution of Jacques de Molay by burning at the stake to the year 1313. Other references give the year 1314. The Council of Nicaea, convened by the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, rejected pagan beliefs, at least that's what they said, such as reincarnation, which were held by early Christians, and presented Jesus as God incarnate rather than a human spiritual teacher. Our contemporary knowledge of the Gospel of Mark dates back to 1958 when an American professor of theology, Dr. Morton Smith, discovered references to it in a letter by Clement preserved in a desert monastery. According to Smith, 
The inner teachings of Jesus were passed by him to his disciples during the initiation rite, which resembled those of the pagan mysteries. Smith interprets the ritual communion meal practiced by early Christians as a pagan rite descended from the mysteries of Isis and Osiris. It was this esoteric interpretation of Christianity which was accepted by the medieval secret societies rather than the version offered by the church. After a brief lapse to pagan worship during the reign of Julian, the Christian religion quickly reestablished itself in Rome, and under the emperor Theodosius, 378 to 395 AD, the worship of the old pagan gods was finally prohibited. The ideological battle between the popes and the Roman emperors they created raged for several hundred years. The point where we can discern the beginning of these secret societies' influence in this power struggle was in the reign of Frederick II, crowned as Holy Roman Emperor in 1215. With his death in 1250, the Holy Roman Empire collapsed. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the First Lodge in Carolina in the United States received its charter from Frederick of Prussia. For 20 years Europe was devastated by war until in 1273 the concept of the old empire was revived with the crowning of a new Holy Roman Emperor Count Rudolf von Habsburg or Habsburg meaning Castle of Hawks in Austria. For the next 300 years, under the patronage of the Vatican, the Habsburgs extended their empire throughout Europe, based on their temporal power and the spiritual power of the Roman Catholic. Well, I just know you're all up there twisting all around the living room, aren't you? How many of you can still do it? Well, before we went on the air, Sugar Bear and I and Carolyn were doing it. And the reason I'm playing this music tonight is just kind of take everybody back to when times were really good in this country. They're trying to convince us that times were no good during the 50s and the early 60s, and that's a lie. And those of us who lived during that period know that it was the best time in the history of this country for the common man. Everyone had work if they wanted it. The American dream was becoming realized by more people than ever before in the history of this country and what's happening now. The American dream, just since that time, has disappeared for most young people, who, unless they really strike it rich or get into a profession that really jerks the money out of people's pockets. They have no hope of owning their own home for many, many, many years, if ever. Most people in every family now have to work and the children are relegated relegated to government controlled daycare centers they are in fact occupationally orphaned as you struggle just to keep food on the table and a roof over your heads and be able to have a little bit left over for some recreation once in a while those of you who have managed to accumulate assets or in danger of losing them at any moment, any moment you could find yourself homeless in the street, I guarantee it. Did you know that any one of your neighbors could call the police and tell them that you're a drug dealer, and that before three o'clock this coming morning, your door could come crashing down, black, uniformed, flak jacketed, automatic weapon carrying Gestapo could be in your home stripping every member of your family searching every bodily orifice whether or not they find any dope they could still confiscate all of your property bank accounts vehicles and auction them off literally within 24 hours and there's nothing that you can do about it now recently the Supreme Court put some restrictions on this but so far it has not slowed them down nor has it stopped them and a recent memo from the Justice Department has chastised government law enforcement agencies for not meeting their quota their quota of confiscated property from the citizens of the United States of America there's only one thing 
that can save you from all of this and from what's coming, from an economic collapse, is to get wealth in the form of non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets and put them in a safe place where only you can find them and do not keep any record of these items and make sure you don't tell your mother-in-law that you have them. And I'm continuing with the article. The successful alliance between the Habsburgs and the Vatican was seriously weakened by the actions of one man, a crusading reformer who used the symbol of the Rosen Cross on his personal seal. He was the German monk, Martin Luther. When I revealed that Martin Luther was a member of the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Rosy Cross, and that his personal seal was the Rosen Cross, you should see the piles of letters I got from Protestants who blindly revere this man without knowing anything about him, chastising me for revealing to them the truth. But folks, you can write all the letters you want. You will always get the truth on the hour of the time. We may make some mistakes now and then, and if we do, as we always have done in the past, I will come on the air and correct those mistakes. But we never, ever intentionally give you anything that is untrue. Remember that. Martin Luther's personal seal was the rose and the cross, and he was, in fact, a member of the Order of the Rosy Cross. Martin Luther, the man whom many revere, was the founder of the Protestant or Protestant movement. The Reformation, allegedly supported by the Rosicrucians and other secret societies who opposed the Catholic Church, swept through Europe. This period of the Reformation represents a key time in history during which the relationship between the Church and the secret societies changed. Changed, folks. With the Reformation, you see, the Church was faced with an enemy within, which it could not destroy without bringing down its own edifice. With the Reformation, the whole concept of organized religion in Europe was revolutionized overnight. And where there had been one church, now, today, there are literally tens of thousands, all with different dogma, different interpretations, all professing to be the only true church, with the only truth, and with the only claim to heaven. Ah, but if you only knew. Many think that the secret societies were instrumental in this revolution. I can tell you absolutely for a fact that they were. Support from the Grand Masters was offered to the religious reformers because the Reformation was recognized as a means to weaken the influence of the Catholic Church in European affairs. In America, sad to say, much of the Catholic hierarchy has taken on this role in modern times. The Reformation effectively emasculated the political power of the Church. It laid the foundation for the Puritan movement, whose members fled religious persecution in Europe to found a new nation in the Americas based on spiritual principles drawn from Rosicrucian sources, and all of our founding fathers were members of these secret societies. And many people have also chastised me for making that claim, but it is easily proved. Easily. The problem with most of you people is you believe blindly what you're told, and you never check anything. Many of you still believe that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree, and when his father asked him who did it, he told the truth. Well, that's all a lie, folks. There was no cherry tree. He never chopped one down. His father never asked him if he did. And I really don't know if he would have told the truth or not. Most politicians don't. Most politicians do not. It also provided an atmosphere of open-mindedness which allowed the seeds of the Renaissance to flower based on the best ideas of the pagan classical world. Although the Habsburgs were to rule for another 300 years until 1806, the Reformation destroyed any hope 
of a united Europe controlled by the Roman Catholic Church until today. Above everything else, the religious reforms of the 16th century marked the beginning of the period when the Church became determined to exterminate the secret societies which had weakened its power base. I am not aware that the Vatican has changed its policy one iota from this. In fact, its determination has doubled over the past 150 years, even though today the secret societies flourish in America, and with only a wink from the American Catholic Church bishops. In fact, the Jesuit Society was formed to combat this from another secret order of Illuminati, or the Ilumbrados, in Spain. The head of this group was Ignatius Loyola, who was, in fact, arrested by the Inquisition. He used his influence with powerful people to gain an audience with the Pope. He went in on his knees and walked out on his two legs with a papal bull, granting him immunity from prosecution from the Inquisition, from any king, queen, country, or law, save one, the Pope. And he was to found a new order, the Society of Jesus, now known as the Jesuits. See the Oath of a Secret Society, which makes up a chapter in my book. And you will see that they are sworn to destroy the Protestant movement, and Protestants wherever they can find them. Above everything else, the religious reforms of the 16th century marked the beginning of the period when the Church became determined to exterminate the secret societies which had weakened its power base. The secret societies, though they claim to follow the precepts of Jesus Christ, actually provide an alternative version of spirituality to their followers. They deny the divinity of Jesus Christ, they deny that he was the Son of God, or was in actuality the incarnated God upon this earth, that he died, or that has, he was resurrected, or that he sits upon the right hand of the throne of God. Instead, he has become an ascended master, a teacher, and Christ has become an office which anyone can attain. You too can become a Christ in the New World Order. They actually provide this alternative version of spirituality, and it is the foundation of what you know today as the New Age Movement. They allege that the Church had deliberately subverted the teachings of Jesus and teach that there are other sources of spiritual knowledge which are as valid as Christian belief and predated it by thousands of years. In 1738, the first papal bull to combat Freemasonry was issued by Pope Clement XII, this bull threatened any Catholic who became a Mason with excommunication, at that time an extremely, extremely serious punishment. In fact, nothing worse could be imagined. In the 1870s, claims that secret societies such as the Illuminati were using Freemasonry as a cover for radicalism and revolution gave the Church fresh charges to level against the Masonic lodges. The climax of the Church's crusade to destroy the influence of Freemasonry came in the 19th century. In 1864, Pope Pius X condemned socialism and the secret societies in his Syllabus of Errors, which he published following an investigation of revolutionary activities in Italy. Every investigation has found that socialism emanates from the secret societies. Twelve months after the publication of the syllabus, the Pope again condemned the secret societies, specifically attacking Freemasonry as anti-Christian, satanic, and pagan in origin. In 1884, Pope Leo XIII issued a proclamation identifying Masonry as one of the secret societies working to establish Satan's kingdom on earth. He also claimed that Masonry was attempting to revive the manners and customs of the pagans. They have succeeded. Any visit to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas will convince you of that. It has often been claimed that the ultimate objective of the secret societies was to infiltrate the Vatican and place their own man on the throne. See my book for the outcome. 
Some modern critics of the Roman Catholic Church, especially those with ultra-traditionalist views, have seen in the liberalization of the Church in recent years proof that its hierarchy has been penetrated at the highest levels by agents of the secret societies who are working for its eventual downfall. At the celebrations in honor of St. Francis of Assisi in 1986, which stressed the unity of all religions, the Pope participated in a multi-religious prayer for world peace. Traditionalists were horrified to see the pontiff happily share a platform with a Tibetan Lama, a Hindu Swami, a Native American medicine man, a Jewish rabbi, and a Maori high priest. It was noted that the unity of all the world's religions and the recognition that they all derived from the same ancient source is the central philosophy of the secret societies. It is the goal of the World Council of Religions. It was the message of Pope John Paul II in Denver, Colorado. Dear listeners, and he replaced the last pope who tried who tried to be a good pope he was murdered after exactly 33 days in office now i read this from la traviata la traviata the december 1993 issue, I believe. Is it the December? Yes, December 1993 issue. To show you that I'm not the only insane person out here who has discovered the truth amongst all the lies. Anyone can do it. I don't know who wrote that. I never saw that paper before. It was sent to me by a Kaji member. The author's name, I don't believe, is listed there. And even if it was, I still don't know him. Anyone who wants to look for the truth and find it will find it. It's not hidden, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, today, even though it began as a conspiracy hundreds and thousands of years ago, today it is all being done in the open. They believe that all of us are so stupid, actually, that they even write books about it, disclosing their whole intentions, all of their plans. Knowing that none of you will ever read those books, and if you did, you wouldn't believe it. I said, none of you. That's not really true. There's some of you out there who are learning, who are awake, who are struggling, who are fighting this battle with me and with Carolyn and with many others to try to save the penultimate achievement of all of mankind throughout the history of the world. And that's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of the United States of America. When I make a statement like that, I always get letters or people call if I open the phones and say, how can you make that statement, Bill, when you just told us that our founding fathers were members of these secret societies? Very simple, folks. Read the writings of the founding fathers. They will tell you themselves. This was a great experiment to see if man was capable of ruling himself, and if he was, this would be the culmination of the great work. But you will also find in their writings that they understood human nature better than any of us do or probably ever will. For they knew, they knew that with the keys built into the Constitution, we would give up our creator-endowed rights and trade them for benefits from the state, thus relegating ourselves back into the old, the old position of owned property. We would become indentured to the state for accepting these privileges. But they knew that people did then, as they do today, except for a very few people who really understand and appreciate freedom and understand the responsibilities and the consequences that go along with it, 
they understood that most people spend the first 20 years of their lives struggling to become responsible and to be accepted as a man or a woman in their own right, able to be responsible, strike out on their own, build a business, sign contracts. And once they discover the responsibilities and requirements that freedom demands, they spend the rest of their life trying to crawl back into the womb, searching for a daddy, a daddy to take care of them. That's why socialism is so attractive to most people, ladies and gentlemen. It tells them they no longer have to be responsible. Then in exchange for their freedoms, Daddy the State will take care of them. Daddy the State will give them a job. Daddy the State will pretend to pay them if they pretend to work. Daddy the State will provide them with some sort of a hovel in which they can live so they don't have to worry about paying the rent. Yes, Daddy will even change their diapers and give them clothes to wear. Daddy will tell them what time in the morning they can go out on the street and what time in the evening they must be inside their hovel. Daddy will discipline them. Daddy will make sure that there's no crime to threaten them. Oh yes, many, many people will love the New World Order and the New World Religion and the new world of entertainment that will be erected in place of the old Roman circus in order to keep the populace entertained and diverted. Mindless libraries will be filled with the new history books and the new politically correct dogma of the new politically correct world and the new politically correct religion and everywhere you look you will see the symbols of the generative force the phallus of Osiris the representation of the old god of Babylon Baal Nimrod Isis will be everywhere you see for Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church, Horus is the great body of initiates that will rule you. They call themselves wolves. And of course, of course, dear listeners, you are the sheep, the legal and lawful prey of the wolves. A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden, and yes, stakes on the table by choice and consent. If we didn't love you here, we would not say these things to you. Please wake up, good night, and God bless you all. Welcome once again to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read to you an article from La Traviata, La Traviata, the December 1993 issue. And uh, I'm going to read this to you so that you'll know that I'm not the only one out here who's stark raving mad, as some of you tend to think. I want you to hear that not only, not only have I reached the conclusions that I have reached through years and years of diligent and very, very deep research, but many others have reached the same, and I mean the very same, conclusions. This is entitled, Secrets in the Vatican II, The Church and the Secret Societies, A Brief History. Pay close attention, and as always, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you have a so pay close attention, folks. This is very important. When the lodges of speculative, as opposed to operative Freemasonry, were founded in the 17th and 18th centuries, this knowledge was transformed into the symbolism which today forms the basis of Masonic ritual. With the persecution of alternative spiritual beliefs in medieval Christian Europe, the guardians of this ancient wisdom went underground, forming secret societies to preserve their pagan ideals, and these societies became 
the mysteries. The two major secret societies which were formed in this period, although they only revealed themselves in a public form in the 16th and 17th centuries, were Freemasonry and the Order of the Rosy Cross. While the Order of the Rosy Cross, or the Rosicrucians, is still a secret society which has received little publicity in modern times, considerable public attention has been drawn to Freemasonry recently. An ancient and pre-Christian tradition handed down from pagan times. The medieval Masons inherited this secret tradition in the form of symbolic teachings which expressed spiritual truths. These teachings originated in the pagan mysteries which were followed wildly, widely and wildly in the ancient world. These medieval Masons inherited esoteric knowledge from their pagan forebears, and this knowledge was incorporated into the sacred architecture of the cathedrals. Now, I want you to pay real close attention, because during my series on the mysteries, when I found out what was concealed within most of the altars that were built during those times, and I related it to you over the air, many people called me a liar. And you're going to hear verification of this, what was found, not only within the altars, but throughout these cathedrals. <laughs> oh my. The Masons regarded geometry as the most important of the arts and sciences according to their beliefs. Geometry had been taught by a pre-flood patriarch called Lamech, who had three sons. One invented geometry, Another was the first mason, and the third was a blacksmith who was the first human to work with precious metals. In common with Noah, Lamech was warned of an impending flood caused by the wickedness of humanity and the interference of the fallen angels in world affairs. Lamech and his sons decided to preserve their knowledge in two stone pillars so that future generations would discover it. The Masons believe that one of these pillars was discovered by the Greek god Hermes, also known to the Greeks as Hermes Trismegistus, or Thrice Greatest, and to the ancient Egyptians as the ibis-headed scribe of the gods Thoth, pronounced tablet and a pen or pencil by your side at all times when you listen to the hour of the time. At a recent Church of England synod, a report on Freemasonry was presented to the assembled clerics and laypeople for debate. Several speakers denounced Masonry as contrary to the teachings of Christianity and condemned Christians, especially clerics, who might be members. One speaker even went so far as to attack Masonry as blasphemous because he claimed its central initiation ritual which involves a symbolic death and rebirth enactment, was a travesty of the Christian belief in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Since its inception, Freemasonry has been the target of Christian wrath. In the inner circle of Masonry, among those who have obtained higher degrees of initiation, there are Masons who understand that they are the inheritors of 